My name is Cheryl West, and I'm the Director of Counseling, Youth Development, and Leadership with the East Syracuse Manoa School District. Thank you for viewing our presentation tonight. We have a lot of great information to share. Tonight, you will hear from three college representatives and one high school counselor as they talk about everything from timelines, deadlines, and college visits to applications, essays, and next steps. This is an informative event that will give you different perspectives from a variety of colleges and help you as you prepare for the exciting journey of exploring and applying to colleges. This event will remain posted on our website so that you will be able to review it again at any time or share it with others. Thank you and enjoy the presentation. Hi everyone and welcome to this quick presentation on the college admission process. This video will be focusing on the standard practices for private four-year institutions like Lemoyne College. My name is Hannah Cross and I work as an admission counselor at Lemoyne. I will briefly discuss the necessary materials for a completed college application and important timelines and deadlines to keep an eye out for. Here at Lemoyne, like many other colleges, we utilize a holistic admission review process, which takes into consideration the following factors, but always keeps the whole person in mind. The four most important factors in the admission process are standardized tests, transcripts, recommendations, and your essay. In some cases, interviews are also required or recommended for particular institutions or academic programs. Whether or not a college offers evaluative interviews, we strongly recommend connecting with your admission counselor whenever possible. Every interaction helps us to get to know you a little better. Although still a factor in the college admission process, in recent years, more and more colleges and universities, even highly selective schools, have moved to test optional policies. However, many colleges with test optional policies still accept SAT or ACT scores. Be sure to review test policies for all institutions that you're considering. In some cases, standardized test scores are still required for specific academic programs or merit scholarship consideration. The COVID-19 pandemic has further changed this process in that most colleges and universities move to test optional policies for the fall 2021 admission cycle. This will seemingly continue for many institutions for the fall 2022 admission cycle, but it's unclear yet what the future impact of these changes will be. Additionally, in 2021, the College Board announced the discontinuation of SAT subject tests. One less thing to worry about. Most colleges don't have a preference over whether you submit SAT or ACT scores. If you take both, many institutions will typically super score, which means they'll accept the higher score between the two tests. This is also applicable if you take one or both tests more than once. Admission counselors can often take the highest score from each section to work in your favor. Check out the Kaplan test prep quiz to see if the SAT or ACT exam is a better fit for you. Here at Lemoyne, we have been test optional for admission for several years, relying more heavily on other application factors, such as the high school transcript, essay, recommendation, and personal qualities. Arguably, your transcript is the most important factor in the college admission process. In addition to reviewing initial tools like overall GPA and rank in your class, College admission counselors take a lot of time looking very deeply into your transcript. This includes checking to see the rigor of the coursework that you've taken and how many advanced or honors courses are in your schedule within the offerings at your particular high school. We also look for trends such as increasing level of course rigor or trends in grades, whether down or up. As a New York State school, we also pay special attention to Regents exams. At Lemoyne, we look for students to be on track for an advanced Regents diploma. Review the recommendation requirements for each college that you're applying to. Some require one letter of recommendation to come from your high school counselor, others require one or more teachers, and some require or accept additional recommendations. Junior year teachers are typically a good choice to ask since they instructed you in an upper level class and can speak to your recent academic performances. Be sure to choose someone who knows you well. If the college you're interested in allows more than one letter of recommendation, Consider asking professionals who know your character outside the classroom, like an athletic coach or even an employer. 
These types of letters give admission counselors a better look into who you are outside of the classroom past your grades. Remember to ask for your recommendations way in advance of the deadline to allow your recommender an adequate amount of time to write the letter. Be sure to thank them. A majority of schools accept the Common application found at the link below. If you apply to multiple schools using the Common app, you may use the same essay for several different college applications, but always be sure to double check. Over 900 colleges are active in the Common app network. Some schools require multiple essays or supplements, which are just as important as your main essay and can be easily attached to your application. It's a common misconception that you need a unique topic for your essay essay to stand out. Our advice would be to pick a topic that you're comfortable with or passionate about. Keep in mind that we're trying to learn about you. For example, if you're writing an essay about something that another person did that impacted you, be sure to ask yourself if the reader's learning more about that person or about you. If you have a special circumstance that you'd like us to consider, we'd suggest using the additional information section rather than explaining it in your essay. Remember to proofread. Check for spelling and grammar and read it out loud to others. This is often the best way to catch mistakes and funky sentences. If others are giving you feedback, remember to keep your essay in your own voice. We wanna read your essay, not theirs. We would encourage you to check in with the admission office to make sure that your application is complete. Next, I'll show you an example of what a student portal might look like. Here's an example of a student portal for a made up student named Patrick. You can see that there are many informative resources for applicants as well as a checklist for required information. This is how we track missing materials for every student during the application process. Most schools provide a personal login so that you can check your application status at any time. Being organized will help relieve the stress of the application process. Most colleges use email as their primary communication tool, so check your email on a regular basis. It's probably best not to use your high school email address you might consider creating a separate email account just for college information. This way, no important information gets lost in a crowded inbox. Keeping track of application deadlines can be overwhelming. We would advise you to start a spreadsheet with deadlines during the summer before your senior year. As you become interested in different institutions, record their application deadline in the same spreadsheet. Most colleges begin accepting new applications in August or September. There are four application plans with varying deadlines. First is the early action. It's a fall deadline in which you apply and receive your admission decision, typically by mid-December, but you are not committed to the college. This option ensures that you receive an admission decision early in your senior year and gives you plenty of time to think about your options. Early decision offers a similar timeline, but if you are admitted to the college, you are bound to attend that institution. This should be reserved for your first choice college. Some colleges offer early decision one and early decision two deadlines. So be sure to take notes of those dates. Regular admission deadlines are typically after the early admission process around January 1st, but must be met in order to be considered for admission. Decisions are usually released by April 1st. Rolling admission means that you can apply at any time in the process on a space available basis. Once your application is completed, you will usually receive a decision in just a few weeks, but you will have until at least the national candidate response date to reply. The national candidate response date, May 1st, is the date in which you must let all institutions that you were admitted to know if you accept or decline your admission offer. This date is applicable for all application options except early decision. An acronym that you will become very familiar with is the FAFSA, or the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. This is a form you will complete every year that the student is enrolled in college. Check out the website through the link on the slide. 
This form is available to be completed starting in October of the year prior to when you plan to enroll, typically the fall of your senior year of high school. Each college will also have a deadline or priority deadline for you to file the FAFSA in order to be considered for need-based financial aid. These are also important dates to include in that spreadsheet. Some colleges and universities also require the CSS profile form, although Lemoyne does not. Some scholarships can be awarded through the admission office based on your high school academic performance. These merit scholarships are usually separate from need-based financial aid, but may have other application requirements such as SAT or ACT scores. If your family experiences changes of jobs or financial circumstances, be sure to communicate with the college's financial aid office so your award package may be altered accordingly. The best way to see what a college is all about is through their social media. Feel free to scan the QR codes on the PowerPoint to visit our Instagram and Facebook pages. Many institutions have extensive information available on their website, but sometimes things can be hard to find. If you ever hit a roadblock, don't hesitate to call the admission office. We're happy to help. How to apply to SUNY. SUNY has 64 colleges and universities across New York State. Students can choose from 7,000 degrees and certificate programs on campus or online. The SUNY application makes it easy to apply to one or many colleges that offer the degree of your dreams. In this video, we'll cover how to apply to SUNY, information about the common app, SUNY deadlines, test score requirements, and the cost to apply to SUNY schools. How do I apply to SUNY? You can use the SUNY application to apply to undergraduate programs at SUNY. If you are a new student or a transfer student, visit suny.edu slash apply to create an account and get started. When you fill out the SUNY application, make sure you have a list of your campus and program choices. Some campuses have their own application. Graduate applicants must use a campus application as well. Can you apply to SUNY with the Common App? Many students use the Common App to apply to SUNY colleges. 25 SUNY schools accept the Common App. Are test scores required? SUNY does not require SAT or ACT test scores for students applying to bachelor's degree programs through the spring of 2023. SAT and ACT test scores may still be required for select programs, merit scholarships, and student athletes at some SUNY campuses. Non-native English speakers may be required to demonstrate English proficiency by submitting scores from SAT, ACT, TOEFL, IELTS, or PTE. Is there a fee to apply? There is a $50 fee for each SUNY campus you list on your SUNY application. The application fee may be waived for certain applicants and programs. Students seeking a fee waiver can submit a request form. Transfer students graduating from SUNY or CUNY with an Associate of Arts or an Associate of Science will automatically receive seven free applications. What is the deadline to apply? SUNY does not have a single application deadline. The earlier you apply, the better. We recommend checking the application deadlines at your chosen campuses to ensure a seat in the program of your choice and for your best chance at the housing and scholarships you want. Many SUNY campuses have early decision and early action deadlines. What to do after you finish your SUNY application. After you submit your SUNY application, watch your email. You will see messages from the colleges you've applied to with important information about your next steps. Once you submit your application, make sure you start or finish your FAFSA application for financial aid. Your information will automatically be sent to the colleges you list on the FAFSA form. If you have any questions about your SUNY application, SUNY's Recruitment Response Center is ready to answer your call, chat, or email. Good luck! We can't wait to see you at SUNY. Hi everyone, my name is Matt Masenzio with Onondaga Community College. I'm very excited to participate in this event with you guys today um, in order to give you a little bit of information on OCC. 
So I am going to start by sharing my screen with you so you can see what we're going over today. All right, so um, the main topics that we're going to focus on today are the admissions process at a community college and why it differs from a four year institution. Um, the placement tests as well as GPA that we may be looking for here at OCC, um, different transfer agreements that we have, as well as living on campus compared to commuting. Um, so go back to me. So to begin with our admissions process um, compared to a four year school. So here at OCC, you know, we are a two year school or an associate's degree school. Um, so the highest form of degree that you can achieve here at OCC would be that associate's degree. Um, a majority of students, um, especially our um, traditional high school students coming in, are looking to transfer to a four year school after completing the associate's degree here at OCC. Um, a majority of our programs are actually very, very simple when it comes to the application process to get into. Um, you know, all we're really looking for is for students to have an application on file as well as showing proof of completion of high school. So getting those high school transcripts sent over to us. Um, once those things are in, like I said, for a majority of programs, um, you know, the acceptance will come pretty soon after that. Um, but there are a few programs more in our health field, so nursing or surgical technology, um, physical therapy assistant, um, those types of programs have additional um, pre-admission requirements um, that go along with the admission process. So those have a little bit more to it. But as I said, um, you know, a majority of our programs, all we're looking for is that application as well as those high school transcripts. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you again so that you guys can see exactly how to navigate our website to figure out how to apply. Um, so here we are on the main page of SUNYOCC.edu. Um, so you can just click on this red box that says apply now, um, or if you want to, you could scroll down to this red box here that says apply. So you would click on apply. Um, and then you would scroll down right to this red box and click on complete our application for admission. Um, once you get to this screen, there's about four different pages just like this. Um, as I said, you know, it is a, it's a pretty easy application to fill out. Um, it will take you less than five minutes to complete um, as well as it's free. So you can't beat free. Um, so that's nice and easy to do. Um, Again, as I said before, if you're looking for any of our health programs, um, there is a little bit more to them um, and you would be able to find the different um, requirements right online. Um, but some of them just to say um, are one like for nursing, you have to take something called the T's test, um, which is essentially a an entrance exam um, for nursing um, just to see where students are at. It is a standardized test. Um, as well as we like to see where students are at with their chemistry, their biology, um, to see if they're at the right level to begin with some of those courses. Um, so I am now going to go back to my PowerPoint slide. All right, so next off, um, we have our placement tests um, and GPA. So here at OCC, we actually are not too worried about um, placement testing anymore. Really all we would be looking for for those placements are looking at the high school transcripts. So seeing what you get in your different classes is what's going to help you um, get placed into classes when you're here at OCC. Um, other than that, we're not really looking at SAT scores, ACT scores, anything of that sort. Um, GPA comes into play again more for the placement of what classes you're going to be going into as well as placement for those certain classes like nursing um, or the surgical tech. They look, like to look at those biology scores, those chemistry scores, um, to see that you're at the right level for the class to really um, dive, in, dive in and get going with it. Um, as for the transfer agreements, um, I am going to show you our website again. So here we are back on the website. Um, if you were to go right up to the search bar here, again, our, our website is very easy to navigate. Um, you type transfer right into the search bar. 
um, click search. And this first um, link that comes up, transfer assistance, you can click into that one and you will see all the different transfer agreements. Like I said before, um, you know, a majority of students are looking to transfer once they come in here to OCC. However, we do also have different um, programs that are direct to the workplace programs after you get your associate's degree with us. Um, so the two different types of transfer agreements we have here at OCC are dual admission agreements as well as articulation agreements. Um, so when it comes to a dual admission agreement, the way that it works um, is a student um, would need to know the school that they want to transfer into as well as um, the program that they're into. It's pretty specific here. Um, and students, as long as they are accepted into both schools, um, or once they are accepted to OCC, as long as they um, complete the OCC degree and meet all of the requirements for the four-year school, they will be guaranteed acceptance into that four year. Um, the difference between that and an articulation agreement, um, and the articulation agreement, as you can see, there are many more schools that are involved with that. Um, you're not automatically um, guaranteed acceptance. You still do have to apply to the other school and get accepted to that school. Um, however, as long as you still are accepted to the school after completing all of the um, admission requirements here at OCC for that four year, um, then as long as you're accepted, you are guaranteed junior status at that school. So you'll have all of your gen ed requirements out of the way, as well as building a foundation in whatever it is you're studying so that once you get to that next school, you'll be ready to dive right into it and get going. Um, now I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint slide one more time. All right, so last but not least, uh, living on campus versus commuting. Um, so I actually myself was a student here at OCC and I was a commuter. Um, so there are pros and cons to both commuting and living on campus. Um, to start with, if you are a commuter, obviously, you know, you're not paying the money to live on campus. So you are saving a little bit of money there, um, which is always a good thing, especially in college. Things can be pretty expensive. Um, however, you aren't getting as much of the college experience when you're living at home, um, but you still are able to have more of a, uh, a free time or more of a, a life outside of school. So maybe you want to have a job on the side while you're taking classes or something like that. Um, you just have a lot more free time. Um, you know, you also get to have home cooked meals, you know, having a home cooked meal from uh, one of your parents, nothing ever beats that. Um, but other than that, um, you know, there also are very good reasons to live on campus. Um, living on campus, obviously, you'd be in dorms, you would be around a bunch of other people who are living in the dorms as well, um, having suite mates, having roommates. Um, so the, sp the social aspect of living on campus is obviously um, beneficial to being here at the school because you're able to meet a ton of people. You're always on campus, so chances are you'll meet more of the faculty as well. Um, and there's tons of different clubs and organizations and things that you can get involved in on campus. Um, it's just a lot easier to really engage in these different types of clubs and things if you're living on campus because you are always there, of course. Um, also, if you are interested in becoming an RA, that's something that you can do um, starting your second semester living in the dorms and you apply to become an RA and you do have a little bit more of a responsibility as you're kind of overlooking uh, maybe a section of the building or a floor, um, making sure that everything is, is going correctly in the dorms for other students. Um, and what's really nice about that is you also get your um, your living paid for um, on campus. So, you know, being an RA, you still get to live on campus and you get to do so for free. Um, so very big benefit to doing that. Um, as you can see on this screen as well, my contact information is on there. Feel free to reach out to me about anything that I've talked about today, um, especially the application process um, and different programs and things like that that we offer. Um, I'd be happy to talk to any, anybody about those. Um, so again, thank you so much for allowing me to participate in this event today, and hopefully we'll be seeing some of the, your faces at OCC soon.
Hi, my name is Mike White. I'm one of the school counselors at the high school. I will be discussing the counseling department's uh, view on this process and, and what it looks like from the high school perspective. You have heard from all the college reps as they break down the pieces of the application. I have one more unique piece of the application to break down as well, and then I will share an overview of what needs to be done and when. I will be using the counseling department's website as the tool to explain these things and to show resources. As you can see, our web address is esmschools.org backslash CHS counseling. The first unique item I am going to talk about is something called special talents. There are several kinds of special talents. One is in athletics. If you have a rising senior who will be playing college athletics, there are some pieces to this process that are worth knowing. If your student athlete is going to be a division three athlete, which many of our students are, there's not a whole lot that needs to be done other than to communicate with the college coach as well as the high school coach. If your child is one of the unique students who might be competing at the division one or division two level, communication with coaches at the college as well as coaches at the high school are important, but your child will also have to register with the NCAA at the NCAA clearinghouse.net website that you see on our screen. The counselor's role with the NCAA is minimal. We send a transcript when a student requests it to the NCAA for review, and that's about it. Other special talents include things like art, performing arts, architecture, film. Students who might be pursuing majors in these areas may be required to create a portfolio or do an audition. If this is the case for your child, it's really important to know that portfolios and auditions sometimes have different deadlines from the college application themselves. It will be very important for your child to look closely at the websites of each college to find out if they need a portfolio or audition, as well as talk to their school counselor. Now it is time to talk about timelines and what I should be doing when. Often in these presentations, you receive a lot of information, but you're not quite clear of where to start. I'm going to start with the end in mind. So 12th grade, as you can see, we have a tab here. We will meet with all of your students to talk about the college process immediately in the fall of senior year. It's important to note that the college process has two distinct parts to it. There is applying for financial aid, which the child, your student will need your support as a parent to complete. And then there's applying for the college admissions process, whether they get into the college or not. And that's a relatively independent part uh, that the student does on their own. Both for admissions and financial aid, we will provide checklists, which I will show you here, um, and meetings to support your child. So as you will see in this senior meeting packet, your child will receive one similar to this that has information about registering for the SAT and ACT. It will have a checklist of step-by-step -step everything your child needs to do to properly apply for financial aid. This is done as of October 1st of your child's senior year. We have two-year college checklists that break down the unique process to two-year colleges that walks students through step-by-step -step with hyperlinks for important pieces that they need to complete. We also have four-year college checklists where they will go through again, step-by-step. -step. These checklists will make sure your child completes the application fully. We have spots for usernames and passwords as well as some information that helps your child to fill out the college application. They will receive a lot of supports. That's wonderful for the future, but what should my child be doing now? So on our 11th grade page, you will see at the very bottom of our page are some meeting materials. We are currently meeting with juniors in their junior meeting. It's a one-on-one -on -one meeting where we talk about their future plans. We review their transcripts, their courses for next year, 
and how that relates to their future college plans and what they may want to study. In this 11th grade meeting materials, you will see there is a campus visit, campus visit checklist. As you heard, it's important to visit campuses. Often folks don't know what to look for or what questions to ask. This handout provides information for both. It may be useful to bring with you when you go on campus visits. We also talk about the junior college planning guide. This shows what students should be doing and when. We have broken it down by time frame. So in the spring of their junior year, these five items down below are the things we believe they should be doing to be ready for the fall. Researching colleges and creating lists. Visiting colleges, including that may include virtual visits. The SAT or ACT, as you heard earlier, most two-year colleges do not require them, but many four-year colleges will. Talking to teachers about letters of recommendation. Traditionally, three letters are needed for four-year colleges, one from a counselor, two from teachers, and we have informed our juniors in their meeting. They should be talking to two teachers right now and focus on their grades. We continue to give them information about what should they be doing over the summer and what is coming for them in the fall. Again, in the fall, we will meet with your senior right away. We will teach them how to apply to college because they don't know how to do it. We don't expect them to know how. We will provide checklists as well as additional supports throughout the fall. The timeline is when your child returns in the fall, we will meet with them and they will start college applications with the goal of completing them by Thanksgiving break. Then in the spring, they will start hearing whether they were accepted into colleges or not. In May 1st, they will make a commitment to a college. Now that you've heard the general timeline and you've seen the resources that explain that timeline of what your students should be doing and when, there are some additional items that you've heard about tonight that you still may have questions about. Like you heard your child may need to sit for the SAT or ACT exam. How would they sign up for it? The next page in this guideline shows you how to do just that. It's in a question and answer format. Like, do I need to take the SAT and or ACT? And the answers are below. We have the websites of where your student registers. They must register on their own on this website. It has information about the fees for these exams, the dates of the exams, as well as the registration deadline. As you heard earlier, the SAT and ACT are tests you can take more than once. And so you will see multiple dates here if you so choose. Questions about the cost of exams, as well as if you are a student with testing accommodations. And additionally, information about how eventually you will send your scores to colleges and ways that you can save money by getting some free score reports. Next, we have a section dedicated to what colleges look for. These are the items that you heard about this evening. A bunch of helpful web pages, including the Naviance program that your child can use to research colleges, look up scholarships, collect uh, personal information about careers, develop resumes, as well as places for the usernames and passwords for the SAT or ACT. A lot of resources related to financial aid. You as a parent or guardian may find this more interesting than your child at this point in time. If your child is feeling really ambitious and wants to start looking for scholarships, here are some suggestions of places that you can begin doing so. We also gave all of our juniors, or we are currently giving our juniors homework in their junior meeting. We ask them to go into their Naviance account Create a resume for three reasons. One, the resume in Naviance can be formatted and printed for them to use on job interviews should they decide to pursue a job. Two, when they are applying to colleges, they will be asked to list their extracurricular activities, work experience, volunteer experience. Having it in Naviance will make their lives easier. And three, awards and scholarships start popping up for students in junior and senior year. As school counselors, we will review their Naviance account 
and look at their list of activities. So if a scholarship or award pops up that they may be eligible for, we will make your, your student child know about that. There are also places we have steps on how to research colleges, which is one of the items we discussed earlier. As we go forward, please continue to check us out on Facebook and Instagram, utilize our website, and stay up to date with our monthly newsletter that we email. For general questions, please feel free to reference our website at any time. We try to keep it very up to date with relevant information. If you have specific questions to your child or about the college process, please do not hesitate to contact your student's school counselor.